I'm Lauren and this is Improving the World. I am an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak with amazing women of improv all over the world. Today I speak with Jill Bernard based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota and we talk about the deepening of improv. Ooh, what do I mean? How it's shifted and changed over the years. I hope that you enjoy. Hi Jill. Hi Lauren. Today we're going deep, deep into the improv world and talking more over about how improv has progressed and how it has evolved and gotten to a place of more expansive awareness and content and how our perspectives have changed as improvisers as we've gone to the depths of improv. Yay! Yay! You are an improviser and also the education director of Huge Theater, so I'm really curious to see how this informs your opinion. With your experience in improv, is your reason for playing different than when you first started? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. When I started, I was 21 years old, but I feel I was still kind of in a teenage mindset and I was looking for approval. I was looking for people in the dark to clap and laugh for me <laughs> to make me feel complete. Over time, I just grew to love creating things with other people, telling stories together and making something together that we could share just for an instant. Oh, I love that. Just for an instant. Yeah, yeah, that's quite nice. So do you find that improv, therefore, is a mode of communication and connection for you now? And if so, how so? Yeah, a mode of communication and connection. Definitely. I love that we have the opportunity to tell stories that interest us and excite us. Right now I'm teaching a solo improv class and one of the fun things about that is each individual student will do a scene about something that none of the rest of us would have ever thought of. We're getting to see each of us boiled down to our essence. And as a result, you get to share with the audience, you get to share with each other exactly what makes you tick, exactly what rolls in your brain. Explain what you mean by solo improv. So many people really think of improv as a group or a two prof, but what is solo improv? Oh, wow. The improviser is alone on stage and maybe 80% of the time they're playing more than one character. So they're doing a full scene, but mm. they're running around or at least moving their bodies to play more of the characters. Mm. In my own solo show, Drum Machine, it's an improvised musical. So it's one story. I play all the characters. I call it not a solo show because there's a musician with me. So they're creating as much as I am. Really fun. It's really beautiful. The stories that I weave are my own quirky brain on display. <laughs> uh -huh. Nice. So for people who've only seen short form or long form with groups, you still get a suggestion from the audience and you're still doing everything totally improvised off the back of that. Are you continuously getting suggestions or do you just get one and then go from there? I like to do my show with an audience interview and then a historical period. So I ask for someone who's not an improv Supervisor, and I say to them, how do you spend your time? I answered that a million different ways. <laughs> and then I get a historical period and I weave those things together to make a musical. Oh, beautiful. I really understand what you're talking about with this connection being between the audience. So I often think of improv as being a selection of different relationships, myself and the other players, myself and the people in the audience, the characters between each other. When you're doing something solo, I feel like you are creating this connection between your characters, but it's between you and you, but different characters. And then as well between you and the audience and maybe the characters in the audience. So there's still as much connection and communication as before. It's just contextualized differently. I think the relationship with the audience is even tighter because the audience is always afraid for improvisers, mm -hmm. but they're even more afraid for solo improvisers. They're like, why is she up there alone? They're along with you for the journey. They're connected to you in that way. And in terms of the characters, it's really fun to create, to use two different parts of your heart or your mind to create people with vastly different opinions. Because I think we all internalize vastly different opinions. So to play them out as separate people is really intriguing as a mental exercise. I like that idea because I do often oscillate between my opinions within my own head and letting those characters duke it out sounds like perhaps a more healthy thing than just pondering in the corner as I am apt to do. <laughs> 
Jill, when you first started improv, you weren't doing solo work. You were doing group work. And if I do understand correctly, you just auditioned and you'd never taken improv classes. Right. Could you do that now, do you think, with the change in the improv scene? Is that still something that could happen? At least not in Minneapolis where I live. It seems ridiculous that there weren't really any improv classes to take. It was like a year and a half before I thought, oh, I guess I could go take some classes at Stevie Ray's, but there weren't that many classes. It's very funny. We did a throwback Thursday the other year where we played a lot of the old short form games that we used to play. Mm. You didn't need to be as good at improv because they were much shorter and they relied on gimmicks. You could tell by the games we used to choose what our strengths were. And now I think short form is richer where you're seeing full body characters, longer scenes, really rich work, great game mechanics. Yeah. But you could just be a goofball in the 90s and you would have great success. <laughs> We're talking about there are now festivals when there weren't that are not just comedy, but purely improv festivals. There are classes, different people who show up to the workshops, jams, audiences, to be players in groups. If you did a side-by-side -side comparison of the improv scene then and now, what are the massive differences? When I started, there was only really the Chicago Improv Festival and we would all go there to meet with each other. That was the only time you could. And now there are probably two improv festivals every weekend of the year somewhere in the world. But more than that, the best example I can give is in 2002, we had the Funny Woman Festival in Chicago, probably one of the first ever festivals for all women. And what amazed me in that moment is there are 150 women and I had never, I might even cry now remembering what it felt like to see that there were 150 other women doing this thing that I'm doing. We all played a warm up together, Bunny Bunny, which is different than the Bunny Bunny people play today. And I started crying because it was in a higher register. It was just a bunch of women's voices doing Bunny Bunny and I'd never heard that in a big room. When we brought it to Minneapolis as a spinoff, we called it the Tiny Funny Woman Fest. The changes in that festival are that it's no longer just women's voices in a high register. You hear older women's voices, the voices in general are expanding, more queer improvisers. In fact, we changed the name of the festival to the Tiny Funny Fest because we hear from non-binary improvisers mm -hmm. who would love to be part of an event like this and have a home. So we've broadened in that way. And now worldwide, there's so many more than 150 improvisers. In 2002, that was the big pull together of all the women that we could think of nationwide and connect yeah. with on the early internet. It was ridiculous. And now there's 150 women on the wait list for our classes. <laughs> Oh God, I love that. Let's talk about what it was like as a female improviser when you were starting and now. There has really been, as you were rightly saying, this dramatic shift between how many women were in the room, but furthermore, what it looked like to improvise in that scene. And that very much is to do with who you were surrounded by and who was watching. That's been changing. What was it like for you when you looked around you in terms of the improv that you were crafting, what you felt you needed to perform or do at the beginning of this journey versus where you are at present time? I'm lucky that Comedy Sports Twin Cities, where I started, where I still play, has always been feminist just by default. So I feel like I had a lucky upbringing, but still at the time, what I said to women improvisers is, you gotta get out there, you know, you gotta be bold. And we put the burden on not just women, but any improviser who was not aggressive. We asked them to step up, jump in there, don't be afraid, get out there, be fearless. And then improvisers who were quieter or just calmer <laughs> or more emotional than their work kind of faded into the background and sometimes just left classes or left the troupe and we never heard from them again. And I think what's beautiful now is instead of the message being get out there, it's a real sense of 
more real give and take. We're honestly trying really hard to find a balance so that people whose voices are quieter can be heard. And people who don't want to do like big funny Chris Farley comedy where there's still a place for any voice. I realized some time ago that the problem never was that there were not enough women improvisers. There were just too many men. (laughs) Improv has much more supply than demand. So what can we do to legitimately make space for people and make it a place where all voices can be heard and where you're not going to be shouted over or pushed around literally Mm -hmm. or figuratively. That I think is the big change I've noticed. Just for clarity and my own curiosity, when you're talking about, I say original, like the OG messaging, be big, be bold, get out there, jump in, you know, take your moment. Don't question yourself. If you thought you should do it, do it. That was a directed message for the ladies. And you were trying to say this because there was an overwhelming feeling that the ladies were being more genteel and we were trying to lift them to a more performance aggressive place to be on par? Or was that just an overall message? So therefore the quiet faded out, who were the quiet of men and women? The quiet of men and women faded out. Men and women (laughs) and non-binary people who were more thoughtful, more thoughtful faded away. It was the messaging for everybody. And for people who were already aggressive, it was like giving an energy shot to a baby, right? (laughs) To a toddler. Yeah. Um, So giving this boost of more aggression to the people who were already aggressive. You can see it in my book. I wrote Jill Bernard's small cute book of improv in 2002. Some of the essays reflect who I thought I was writing to at that time. In 2002, I was thinking of shy improvisers who needed to be pushed into the limelight. And I still think that's true. People still do come into their first day of improv class shy and fearful, and they do need the encouragement to get out there. In addition to it being a message for everyone, it was really specific, a message for women. Mm. And in your role with Huge Theater, being the director of education, have you been crafting the education in terms of the workshops, constantly augmenting and staying present tense with offering and the language that we're using? Or is it educating staff? Well, we opened the theater in 2010. I wrote the syllabus at that time, and we've been tweaking it all along, of course. And the biggest tweak, it was really a philosophical shift. The Me Too movement kind of shook improv in the United States to the core, at least in the major centers in the United States. As a response, a group of women formed Fair Play Minnesota and called out all the theaters and said, look, here's the state of misogyny and improv in the Twin Cities. Things are happening in improv, on stage, off stage, that make women feel unsafe and unwelcome, make it so that they're not having a good time. I took a look at that and began to work it into all of our classes to make sure that there's a conversation at the beginning of every class where the student is given agency to control how their body is going to be contacted, what Mm -hmm. kind of subjects will come up in scenes. Mm -hmm. If they're in a scene that is gross or icky, if someone says something to them, that is offensive, what rights do they have to make sure that they know that the teacher and the teaching assistant are on their side, but also to send the message to students that we're a little community, right? We're in this class with 16 other people and our job is to make sure everyone has a wonderful time and that everyone's voice is heard. And I know I didn't come into teaching improv with that holistic of a mindset. I'm still learning Like the word community was just introduced to me by a student last year. I was like, wait, you're right. An improv class is a little tiny community. I'm so focused on improv that I'm not thinking about this bigger picture of the 16 of us here in this room. And we talk about trust in improv, but can I trust you if we haven't formed a community? That for me is a growth area. I want to think about that more and more. I trained myself to trust people instantly in that gung-ho early 90s improv environment. You just go for it and you trust and you're like big and bold. But what if we can be more thoughtful about that, more authentic, make sure that people know trust is earned and we should be kind and good to each other. I mean, you would think that would be obvious, but we don't know why people come to improv. Everyone's got different goals. So let's Mm -hmm. say it out loud. 
Yes. Is it okay with you if I ask, do you have any examples that you can give within the context of Me Too that you were talking about? And the reason that I ask this is because I've had a lot of conversations with people, especially guys, about why women are asking for shifts in language, in pauses of moments, in discussions. And the guys that I know and that I improvise with are amazingly thoughtful, kind, intelligent people. And sometimes I am still surprised that I need to give examples. And yet it really seems to help them when I do. So I'll say something like, I'd really like it if we could avoid certain language. And they're like, can you give an example of when that happened? Because they don't realize that it happened. I'm like, oh God, I, I don't know if I can. Sometimes we dance around certain circumstance and it's hard for some people to really be rooted within what it is that we're talking about. Do you have any examples that you are comfortable sharing? Things that you've worked through when moments have clicked or changed within this context? I mean, the most obvious one is what roles we're casting women in, in shows. And I should say it's not only roles that men cast women in, but sometimes roles that women put themselves in because it's familiar or comfortable. You'll see a whole set sometimes where someone's only played moms and girlfriends and secretaries. Today in 2020, sometimes it'll be clear that the woman is supposed to be the hero of whatever story we're on, but somehow she becomes a sidekick. So looking at the role that women are playing. So as you're speaking, I'm thinking of my own examples. Last week, I was at a rehearsal where there was another woman who would normally be present but wasn't, so it was myself and a bunch of gents. So sometimes when I'm asked for examples, I don't have an example because I wasn't clued into it or I wasn't listening for it. But once I kind of clocked in and then I was paying attention, a human character or an animal, it was guys' names, except for the baker. <laughs> the baker was a good character, but I came out of that, I went, oh, you know, wow. And when there are more women in the room, it just doesn't happen as much like that. The conversation that I had afterwards outside of this was about, you know, you're often saying what you see. So you're a guy, you're thinking from your perspective, your vision, your, your world, your filter. Any other context that we can lay down for people? Honestly, Fair Play did such a good job of detailing. They wrote a long open letter to the community that mm -hmm. broke down really beat for beat all of the things they'd been seeing. Women being talked over, just simply that. Is a woman allowed to speak without being interrupted? What were are being used. I had a friend who was consistently called really awful swear words that I would never say in her improv class by fellow students in scenes. Because it was a level one improv class, how does she know, mm -hmm. right? She was like, I guess this is what improv is. And I think that happens a lot. People are like, well, I guess this is what improv is. And so they just go away instead of speaking up because they don't feel at home. He asked me about it and I was like, no, no, that's not normal. That's not okay at all. Tell me the name of your teacher. I will track this person down. Jill, do you think that where you are in Minneapolis, because you had this cohort of women who banded together and helped to really drive this dialogue, that it's different? Do you think that the discussion about Me Too and off the back of that, the changes are particular to where you are or the US? Honestly, I think in a lot of ways, we're thought of as leaders at Huge Theater. People borrow our documents all the time. And I know Fair Play Minnesota is thought of as leaders. There's not a lot of groups doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And when I travel around the country and around the world, it's really sort of patchy. There are places where this conversation is not happening at all. What happens when you make improv equitable for women is you make improv equitable for so many people. The doors start opening. When you think about sexism, you also get to start thinking about racism and ableism and ageism and so many ways in which people are not being heard and being valued come to light. But I do think it's very, very different. There's a contextual construct for every place I go. The history of a city will color very much the way people are talking about Me Too, if they're talking about it at all. Some places it's not a problem. There are places where very naturally people have always been really kind and thoughtful to each other. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you're so lucky. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then I think there are some places where they're deluded. They think everything's okay, but they haven't really examined, asked the right questions. Maybe things will come to the forefront in the years to come. Yeah. We said we're deep. I'm really, if you look at this, just under the water's edge. So <laughs> this idea that where we've gone is a place of expansion, allowance, acceptance, and discussion. Yet, as you rightly said, we're really tip of the iceberg and so far to go. So it will be nice to see where we get to. I love that the discussion doors are open and that places like where you work are being more inclusive in their conversation. It's nice that it's in the writing, really helping to document where we're trying to go. Jill? If you could share words of wisdom, what would you like to share if you could speak to the younger version of you, your improv peers or people who've never tried improv before and we might have just scared the dickens out of them? What do you want to say? What are your words of wisdom? I was going to speak to my younger self. I would say, settle down. <laughs> <laughs> Life is long. You don't have to go so fast. But I think my broader message for improv is that you are enough. That's the message I've been spreading for a few years. You are enough. You, the person that you are, have brought enough to the table for improv. You don't have to be more and you don't have to be less than who you are. You have the raw material to do this work. You mm -hmm. have what it takes. You're not insufficient in any way. Yeah, that's very nice. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Jill, if people want to find you, see a show or take a class, if they're interested in solo improv, buying you a coffee, throwing money in your general direction, how can they do this? At hugetheater.com, spelled the American way. <laughs> ER at the end, because <laughs> the theater is closed for COVID. We're collecting donations at givehuge.com. Home. Actually, we collect donations there all the time because we're a nonprofit. My own work is at jillbernard.com, doing shows on Facebook Live, just ridiculous things. Perfect. Yes, <laughs> please. Ridiculous. Come find me on Facebook and you'll get to see more rooms of my apartment. <laughs> Today, I'm in the kitchen. Hey. Jill, thank you so very much. It was absolutely wonderful talking with you and hearing a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Thank you all for joining us. This is Improving the World. I'm Lauren, and there's more where that came from. Bye. So, did you enjoy the video? If you did, please say kind and wonderful things in the comments down below. And if you're feeling sassy, you can subscribe and look for more Improving the World. Thanks.